Hi, this is Alex. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, do-it-yourself electrophoresis equipment, why you should or uh, shouldn't make your own, um, and just some of my tips for uh, constructing your own uh, a horizontal gel electrophoresis setup. So why should you uh, make your own electrophoresis equipment? Uh, I think there are two main things to consider. First is uh, you'll likely save a fair amount of money by making your own electrophoresis equipment versus purchasing it from a commercial supplier, um, you know, such as Fisher. Uh, the second thing is that the product that you make will likely be uh, more durable uh, and will last you longer than anything that you can really buy commercially. So um, that's two main reasons why making your own would be a good idea uh, especially if uh, you know you're starting a new lab or you're a biohacker and you're uh, just trying to get into um, uh, gel electrophoresis so you can do so with very little money uh, and come out with a good product uh, by making your own uh, a couple of reasons why you shouldn't uh, make your own is that um, if you don't have the time uh, for example, you know, drawing up some plans, uh, getting the material, actually putting it together, uh, it'll take some time. So if you're busy with experiments and uh, if the little free time that you have, uh, you, you know, you can bear of uh, spending a couple more hours uh, making your own equipment, then uh, this, uh, this kind of thing is probably isn't for you and that's okay too. Uh, another thing is you'll need some basic, t well, you know, you'll need some tools. Uh, the first thing that's, I think, pretty necessary to make uh, your own electrophoresis equipment is something uh, like a table saw, something that can cut through uh, polycarbonate that will leave nice clean cuts. Uh, a bandsaw is nice to have and kind of a little miscellaneous odds and ends. A soldering iron for soldering on the uh, electrodes and that sort of thing. So if you don't already have these tools uh, and if you can't borrow them from a buddy uh, then maybe um, that's one reason why you uh, wouldn't want to make these. Uh, thirdly is safety. So a lot of commercial lab equipment or sorry commercial electrophoresis equipment uh, will come with lids that fit over the entire gel chamber uh, and they have the electrode uh, uh, receptacles built in so that basically you can only disconnect it by removing the lid uh, and it reduces your chance of electrical shock because it's much harder to complete the circuit uh, through the lid. Um, basically uh, whether or not it's necessary is kind of an interesting issue. I think the manufacturers build it in as a liability thing. Uh, personally, I've used homemade electrophoresis equipment since I was trained uh, years ago and I've never gotten uh, shocked even once or even felt a tingle. So uh, not using a lid and applying the ele electrodes individually uh, doesn't seem to be that much of a safety issue, uh, at least for me. Uh, but it's something that you may want to consider uh, and also, you know, liability, right? Uh, so, if you do decide to go down the path of uh, making your own equipment, um, you want to look at what materials that uh, you'll need. Uh, a sheet of Lexan um, that's about you know three millimeters thick will cost you about fifteen bucks. Uh, something that's about ten mil millimeters will cost you I don't know, maybe thirty or forty. Uh, but out of one sheet, you can get you know at least three or four of these. Um, three or four of these gel casting trays and you can get maybe get one or two uh, gel casting chambers. Uh, so just to get into the cost a little bit, a commercial setup, uh, so that includes one gel casting chamber, uh, it includes one uh, gel casting uh, tray, uh, and maybe one or two combs, depending on which kit you get, uh, will run you about, let's say, 300 bucks easily. Uh, if you break this, 
uh, that's another 75 bucks from the manufacturer. You would be lucky to find it any cheaper than that, and uh, very likely it'll cost you more. Um, replacement combs, uh, same thing, probably 30 bucks a piece, 20 bucks a piece, uh, maybe more. Uh, maybe you can buy them in bulk, but uh, I haven't seen uh, good alternatives um, other than that. So that's for you, what you're looking for in cost. The cost of making your own, so uh, 15 bucks uh, for maybe three or four of these, so uh, maybe five bucks a piece, four bucks a piece. Uh, for the actual chamber, I don't know, maybe 20 bucks. Um, you also have to factor in the uh, electrodes, the banana jacks, uh, as well as the electrode wire material that you use. So uh, traditionally speaking, um, electrode wire was made with platinum wire. Uh, however, you know, it's kind of expensive a bit, hard to get a hold of. I happen to have a whole box here scavenged from various equipment, but if you can't get a hold of it, um, there is an alternative. Uh, it's called Monel wire, uh, and it's basically uh, corrosion resistant type of wire used in boat building applications, which uh, won't corrode the moment that you turn on uh, your power supply. Uh, so those are essentially the materials you'll need. So uh, some kind of uh, polycarbonate, um, uh, different thicknesses, uh, you'll need banana jacks uh, and electrode wire. Uh, so there are a lot of, there are a couple of different plans that you can use for making electrophoresis equipment. Uh, one guy called Abizar Lakdwala, uh, he made a really nice video uh, of his design. The University of Utah did a really, really nice write-up. Uh, and they give you a full bill of materials, how to construct it, etc. Um, so there are plans available, uh, but really you don't necessarily have to follow them. Uh, as long as it's, you know, generally this size, generally this shape, uh, you can make your gel chambers and uh, your uh, casting trays even bigger if you like, if you want like gigantic gels, or you can make them smaller. The exact size doesn't particularly matter, the exact dimensions don't matter, uh, as long as your um, trays fit in your chamber uh, and, you know, there's room for buffer, uh, you can't really screw this up. Um, yeah, so you can follow plans, but don't be too... Uh, I, I would say be creative, uh, make your own design. Uh, that's what I would do. Uh, so you'll need a gel chamber, uh, you'll need to make some trays, um, you know, this is the profile of my design, it's pretty simple, fits right in there. Uh, and then as for combs, um, you can make them in many, many different ways. So uh, this is one of the first combs that I got 3D printed, I got it from Shapeways. Uh, and it's held up actually for almost, you know, two years, three years of abuse. Uh, it was actually a pretty good investment. It cost me, you know, maybe eight bucks each to get printed, but they've lasted a long time. My homemade 3D printed combs, uh, they're less durable. They only last for a couple of months and then the teeth start coming off. But, you know, uh, they do work well for a while. What I've been finding luck with recently uh, is just cutting combs out of uh, sheets of uh, PTFE or Teflon, uh, and that works quite well. Uh, you have to mount these type of flat combs on jigs. Um, they're about, you know, that shape. Uh, and they sit in your tray like that. Uh, so that's how you'd mount these sort of like flat Teflon combs. And, uh, yeah, I, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, the product that you make uh, with your own equipment will likely outlast any anything that you can buy uh, right now. Uh, so, for example, this, uh, this uh, gel chamber is before my time. 
Uh, it's likely over 20 years old. Um, and yeah, it was made before I even decided to become a scientist. So uh, it's held up this entire time. You know, I could kill a man with this thing, no problem. Um, this is uh, the difference between a store-bought commercial gel casting tray and one that I've made myself. So uh, as you can see, the store-bought one uh, is basically completely disintegrating. You can hear a creak, or maybe you can't. You can hear a creak when I uh, squeeze it and basically uh, how this happens is when you pour boiling hot agarose in a tray, you don't let it cool and with uh, these types of materials they'll actually crack. But life's too short to wait for your agarose to cool. Uh, these uh, trays made out of polycarbonate, you can pour agarose boiling, boiling, bubbling hot and they will not crack. The reason the, uh, to this is that the uh, store-bought stuff is uh, basically a cheaper material, it's slightly acrylic, uh, and it has a glass temperature, a plastic glass temperature of approximately uh, 100 degrees C, whereas polycarbonate uh, has a glass temperature of about 150 degrees C, and that makes a huge difference when it comes to the durability. So. Um, yeah, it, essentially you don't have to wait for your agarose to cool. You just pour it right in here, put in your comb, and you're good to go. Uh, no waiting required. So I really think that most commercial manufacturers uh, cheap out on the material. Uh, and their gel um, chambers use much thinner material, so um, yeah, uh, yeah, you can break them very, very easily. So yeah, I, I think I covered most of the reasons, or, or most of the reasons why you wouldn't, why you would and wouldn't want to make your own gel electrophoresis equipment. Uh, like I said, you don't have to follow exact plans as long as it looks something like this. It will go. I I believe you me. Um, we do I think very good research with this kind of equipment, uh, and we've never had to buy. Uh, commercial gel equipment um, and also some of the reasons why you wouldn't want to do it so uh, good luck uh, if you decide to make your own uh, and uh, yeah have fun <laughs>